So my name is Nick Davidoff. My wife Marina and I run DVC, which is a collective VC firm. So we're like a standard VC firm, but we only have private individuals as our LPs. And there are 99 of, the, of them. Most of them are engineers. Most of them are doing AI. So naturally, we are looking at a lot of machine learning technology. Uh, we've been doing this uh, since 2012, so not new. As I've heard, like there are only three things that are happening faster than the speed of light. The first one is the time between like the uh, street light going green and you're hearing a honk from behind in San Francisco. And uh, the second one is experts in everything becoming AI experts. So this is also uh, faster than the speed of light. So welcome to AI Mad Tea Party. We are here citing, quoting Lewis Carroll. Um, and the quote goes as, it takes all of the running in the world to just stay in one place. And if you actually want to get somewhere, you got to be running twice as fast. And this is exactly how it feels currently in the AI startup scene. And uh, please welcome together with me at, at, at this panel, we have uh, Michael Stewart, partner at M12. M12 is Microsoft's VC arm. And naturally, they're investing in a lot of awesome AI technology. I looked at their portfolio, I'm jealous. We have Ted Sami, Senior Director of Cloud and AI, Microsoft. Hi, Ted. And give it up to uh, Jessica Greenwald, founder of Onum Games uh, and Pixel Kid. Uh, so, and since we're here wearing fun hats, I, I just wanted to remind you of the book, like uh, when Alice comes to the tea party, the Matt Hatter and the um, Hare are having a party and they like, Every time they talk, they have to switch places. So I just I suggest doing just just once. So let's uh, let's maybe switch places. And uh, okay. Okay. So Ted, you are now the moderator. No, I I, I, I want uh, make make, uh, make make that happen to you. I'll take the blame for this panel being boring, because we don't want it to be boring. We actually want it to uh, be relatively short. So this is only going to last like 20, 30 minutes, and then you can talk to each other. I mean, so just for you to, uh, basically, we've been looking through the list of attendees, and you made the cut from 1,500 applicants. So welcome. That was pretty, pretty crazy. So uh, most of the people here, most of you are AI founders. Then the second biggest cohort are uh, angels and VCs investing in AI startups. We made sure that VCs who write that their VCs have actually at least 10 companies in their portfolio. And that startups present here uh, have raised at least a seed round. Yes, we're cruel to people who are not well funded. Um, so we're all looking at what you guys, I'll, I'll just start with, with Microsoft, is uh, address the, the elephant in the room. So Ted, um, everybody I talk to says Microsoft just gonna make all of the money in the world. Um, maybe OpenAI will, will be second. But how do we compete with Microsoft when technology is no longer a moat and when you guys own all of the distribution channels and all of the relationships with enterprise customers in the world? I'll just pass the mic to you. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I think there's certainly a lot of exciting technology out there and technology can be a strong advantage in Microsoft. Technology at Microsoft has been phenomenal. They're, they're moving at an incredible pace. Um, and OpenAI's models have been broadly recognized as impressive and, and, and world-changing. It's a bit of a banal answer, but I think it's probably the case for many scenarios that startups, one, have an agility um, that larger companies don't have to respond to market, respond to customer needs. And they also have opportunity to potentially pursue things that maybe appear niche, and those are actually great footholds of larger, deeper relationships. When Microsoft and larger companies look at problems, they need things that are gonna move the needle for them. And as these companies get bigger and bigger, they need bigger uh, projects to, to fund against. And so those are great opportunities for new uh, entrepreneurs and new startups to Germany. So if you guys are looking to uh, build automation for uh, kebab kiosks south of Market Street, that's gonna be your niche from now on. Everything else is owned by Microsoft. And uh, I just wanted to, to talk maybe a little bit about startups and, and strategies. Of, uh, so going niche is, is, is an obvious response uh, or uh, the only response that startups have. But startups are going to be competing for customers and, and marketing is changing. Like, How do you navigate this as a startup? Jessica, do you want to take it? Yeah, so on my day to day, my job is to help Fortune 500s stay relevant. And what we're finding is most useful for them and for emerging brands 
is competing on culture. So creating this community or speaking to a niche and building from there, really connecting with people on a emotional level, because then it's harder once, it's kind of like the cost of changing relationships is harder than it is for changing some forms of technology, if you think about it. So if you can connect to people on this deeper relationship level where it's, you as a consumer having a relationship with that brand that you're even part of it you're part of the the idea generation of helping that brand come up with new things that are relevant to you and people like you then the switching costs is is really high for you because it becomes part of your identity i tend to and and i also see this happening outside of um, the companies that i advise tend to see organizations like Fortune 500s or major brands that, that are legacy brands that have stood the test of time, focusing on building super niche communities and growing that niche of cultural power from that super energized, hardcore group of super fans. Yeah, actually I wanna resonate with that too because um, at this time when we're trying to interact with AI in new ways, this is people uh, discovering connection to advanced AI. They're, it's it's generating text based on their prompts or creating images that delight them. This is a chance to totally refresh your your interface with computers. And you know, to your point, many of the assumptions about what the interface looks like or what what the requirements for setting up an account or um, doing commerce look like can be assisted by AI. And I, I think that's really one of the most exciting things that's going on right now is like a total shattering of these preconceived notions of like, what is the interface with the computer? What is the operating system? What is required to know how to use a computer before you can access AI? And startups are the best at completely going out there and exploring this and innovating there. So I think it's gonna be very exciting to see, you know, what, what you guys come up with to delight people, get them using AI more, and then instruct the rest of the, you know, AI developer space, like this is how it's going to be. To that point, in my experience, people are even less patient with technical tools than they used to be and are getting even more impatient as time goes on. So I see AI being used as a tool to help people use technology less or have to think about it less. Cool, and uh, while you were answering this, I actually asked this question to ChatGPT and this is what, I'm not gonna do it to you guys. This is the cringiest thing ever. Please, if you ever run a panel, never do this. So my, my next question is, is, is that the, I was just listening to a founder pitch me an idea of a self-driving enterprise. Because if you can build an agent that automates one person and builds basically a virtual employee, you can automate its manager, and then you can automate its manager's manager, but basically build, brings us to the concept of uh, one person, maybe a team of like two, three people, a family running like a global corporation. And my question here is, as you as, um, as, an, as businessmen, what do you think about this future? Do you, do you embrace it? Do you like the idea of it? I was just talking to one of my friends about this earlier, where in a lot of the organizations I work with, we keep losing copywriters and creatives, which is not the vision that creatives were sold earlier. We were told that all the jobs that would get cut are the super easy to automate technical thinking jobs, but it turns out creatives are getting cut left and right. The people who are left, there's the experience of being that person in organization too. There's a reason that you're motivated to come to collaborate and work together on something. And if you keep losing people to work with, it becomes less motivating. And you're also losing the experience of getting an outsider's perspective. If it's just you in an echo chamber collaborating with the AI that has potentially been hyper-optimized to whatever purpose it is that you're using it for at that time. So I think that there will be a point at which employees speak up and say like, hey, actually, this is, not the, this is not the experience that I want to have. I don't necessarily want to be in charge of everything. Imagine a water cooler talk. Oh, yeah, that's awful. <laughs> yeah, two robots in a person. But, yeah, that's, that's my two cents on that. I, I think that's a really sad world. And this is someone that's coming from someone who would generally classify herself as antisocial. I, I am not the level of antisocial where I only want to talk to a machine and never see any human beings. Yeah, I mean, you mentioned agents. So we are starting to see the first 
startup embodiments of what an agent could be. And it's, it's kind of interesting because this is very, very much a recent technical phenomenon, to, you know, in, in terms of demonstrating this in open source and uh, projects like AutoGPT and Baby AGI. This idea of the human being becoming a manager of the machines. Like I am giving just the most elemental, the most basic instructions to a computer to, to fan out and do a couple of uh, requests simultaneously, keep at it until they're done. This is like at the idea phase, it, make, it makes sense to us, but what's really fascinating is to see some early startups meld this with a go-to-market idea, with a business idea that is really groundbreaking. But I think there's gonna be a couple of waves of trust building that have to happen first. You're gonna need to first trust the AI skills. So I think those of us in the technical world who might be really leaning into AI, probably all of you here in this room, you're, you're either investing or building in AI, you don't need too much help to trust the efficiency of an AI request, of a skill. How much have you integrated this into your everyday life is also, again, in this room, you're probably way ahead of the curve. To make that future of agents something big, it's that level of trust. First, the AI skill, the request, gets you the answer or gets you the result that you want. Then I can start trusting a machine or an agent to do many of these things at once in a very high level instruction and just say like, keep at it till it's done. I think that's really where it gets exciting, but we're starting to just see the first inklings of this as a business now. So with the advent of this technology that is actually, uh, I'm very excited for, uh, and all of the automated agents uh, replacing humans, I hope they start with social security administration and DMV uh, personally. Uh, but what are you guys most excited about, like in 2023? What are you like? What kind of startups? What kind of technologies you're looking for? What makes your heart beat faster? I think what's most exciting for me is that there's a bunch of awesome services out there that are also very expensive, and through some of these technologies, they can make them available. I, I met with one startup that was trying to you know, add LLMs to the college consulting business. So if you're an affluent person, you can hire someone, give them a lot of money and help you get into a great school and that can be a launching pad for you. But for many, that's not a cost of, uh, like, that's not feasible. And I think there's a range of services like that or that are cost prohibitive. And we can make those addressable, like we expand the addressable audiences for those services and, and add some efficiency and scale to them, which unlock a lot of like flattening of the curve and enabling a lot of people to do a lot of things they weren't able to do before. So those are that range of that services, tech-enabled tech services space, um, where they're just services businesses today is really compelling. In, in terms of like what's really exciting, I actually want to just pick on that comment you made about the DMV, because uh, one thing we noticed when we first started surveying the space in terms of like where the AI applications were appearing, what kind of industries, what kind of skills, what kind of markets, it was really everything. That's, that's how you wind up with like 5,000 startups uh, in a couple of months. And really, I think that tells you two things. One is everybody sees some usefulness for this, right? So it's, there's going to be, you know, there will be these application specific AIs, of course. But I'd say the advice to you is find those DMVs, find those unhappy people, because AI probably has a solution for them. That's one of the ways I would kind of flip the script on going after the customers that already have a high degree of automation already and probably have built AI into their applications as it is. Use, take advantage of this giant leap and ease of use uh, and problem solving ability. And again, make those unhappy users happier. Do you remember Microsoft Bob? <laughs> no, does anyone know what Microsoft Bob is? Oh my God. Oh, thank you. It's the origin of Clippy. People, come on. There's, it was like this really weird operating system where you make a house and you get a little character, like Clippy, for example, and the character would tell you all these things. You, mine was usually like a cute little parrot. I, the thing I'm excited about is that cute little animal robot creature following you around and helping you out through life. That is super exciting. I'm, I'm, I'm looking forward to that too. Um, I, I, hope, um, I hope my wife does not replace me with some fun. <laughs> Um, animal that is that is good at writing texts and that is already happening like um, my job as a husband is um, on the verge of being replaced well I gave you guys a promise that we're gonna keep it short and I, uh, like we don't want to go boring I know these people can tell you lots of awesome 
things and like their brain is so big it barely uh, fits in the huge hats and your hat is way too small for your brain. So guys, please uh, talk to each other, talk to the panelists. They are not running away from here. I'm making sure of that. And thank you so much for being such a good audience. Thank you.